to be the the part of so that you come up with when you put together country music and uh, I'm talking about western swing and that sort of country music just pop country in the 40s and uh, old blues and uh, bluegrass I suppose I mean where else could it come from maybe a little jazz from Charlie Christian possibly it was a combination like I said once before of the hillbilly boogie the southern up in gospel beat, you know, the foot stomping, hand clapping, very exciting, enthusi- stomping, hand clapping, very exciting, enthusiastic, a mixture of the Bill Monroe, Mike Wiseman, bluegrass stuff, you know, with uh, maybe a little touch of the old Tommy Dorsey and Glenn Miller boogie woogie once in a while. It's just a combination of the best. Kind of wild, play what you want to. It's just, it's the feel that you put on it. We always said it's just the feel more than how much you put on there. It's what you put on there, the feeling you put behind it. It's what we call rockabilly. For me, it's got to be thumb picking. Um, a drummer is optional. You know, it's got to be a good slap bass. And an acoustic guitar. It's the, the Elvis trio. That's, that's the, the essence. <laughs> Very few instruments, uh, always a stand-up slap bass. You know, without the slap bass, it's not an orthodox rockabilly sound, even though you can still make a pseudo rock and roll rockabilly sound without that. You gotta have that, you gotta have um, the uh, slap acoustic type guitar going back with the electric guitar. You can have a piano, you don't have to have a piano. The orthodox version is three or four pieces, just guitars, bass, and singers. Sometimes you didn't even need drums, you know. They'd beat on a cardboard box or, or whatever. But usually it's a small setup of drums, you know. It's the snare with, uh, you know, the big sticks and stuff like that, and that's really all you need. That's an orthodox thing, mm-hmm. wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. If I was going to uh, describe a rockabilly song, I'd uh, take a country song and put a straight eighth uh, beat to it, you know. Like... Mm-hmm. Is that a straight eight? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope so, man. I don't want to make a fool out of myself on TV here. <laughs> well, I got a gal named Shirley. Rick felt that the, the rhythm was more African, really, and that was all part of rhythm and blues. To me, all it was was just fast hillbilly with a beat, you know, that made you want to dance and boogie. And still is, and was then. Well, I got an open storm. Well, I got a rock and roll. Well, I got a little bar. Well, I got through my soul. It was a combination of young white guys mixing all of their hillbilly roots with what they had learned later, which which was been in our teens, in our up to our teens. All we heard was country or guy Lombardo, and then. Then we started sneaking and listening at night. Howlin' Wolf, hey, <laughs> you know, and uh, we were adding all that into what we're doing. And that's, that's rockabilly, the whole combination of that. To me, rockabilly's always been a folk music. It's the same thing as like Gid Tanner or you know, any mountain music or, or Lead Belly or all that stuff. You know, it's, it's a, you know, it's, uh, folk music's like a guy who can play three chords going. Sam Hill, 
letter, send it by mail, send it in. All right. But rockabilly was the first time that, that that folk music became electric. And so it started the whole rock and roll thing of, oh, I don't really have to know how to play guitar, to play guitar. And, you know, they're great rockabilly instrumentalists, you know, like Scotty Moore and Cliff Galvin, et cetera, et cetera. But the underlying theme was you don't have to know what to do. Pick one up, do it, make noise. And I think that was a real germ of what became rock and roll was, oh, make noise. <laughs> You look like somebody like Hazel Atkins, and Hazel Atkins is like, make noise, let's make noise, let's, you know, scream and yell and break things. And as long as you were rocking. Right. <laughs> you rock on me, don't stop. That's you know, right. we worked a long time without a lot That's of... what we've been trying to tell Paul. Right? But a lot of hit don't records. Don't talk so much. Just hit them. Drive them. Yeah. Gene didn't say nothing. I don't even think he ever said thank you, did he? <laughs> hit them with some more. And then hit them with something else. And yeah. then hit them with something harder than that. Yeah. Don't... Do not stop. Play, do yeah. not let up. They were the punks of the time. You know, I mean, Link Ray is the full-on punk rocker of of the 50s you know i mean all those guys man those guys uh -huh. were all bad dudes man they were they were cool man hood music you yeah, know greasy yeah, hood music blades uh motorcycle boots that kind of stuff yeah that stuff there uh having a good time type music it wasn't negative like the punk thing because you want to have a nice car and you want to have like some nice clothes to go out and take your girl out and go see the band. So it was a positive thing. There's no song that's rockabilly that you don't look through the audience or if you're if anywhere you're at that they're not patting that foot, snapping them fingers, or with a good, pleasant look on their face. And that's how I, I define rockabilly. It just makes you feel good. I, I've seen them try to raise cast with a broken foot. <laughs> it will lift. A broken foot. That's what it is. I ain't got no matches. Got a long way to go. This is the yeah. tune that inspired me to play rock and belly. Mr. Train. I played with uh, Junior Parker. I was on uh, most of his recordings. I made a recording with Rufus Thomas and uh, played with uh, Bobby Bland. Now, these are songs that I thought up uh, uh, when I was in Mississippi. You know, before I started playing with them guys. But it was my ideas. The Mystery Train and Love My Baby were actually your ideas? All of them. Feeling good. All of them, my idea. What we had when, when I was listening to the original 45, and I didn't know this until 20 years later, was the, the backside of, of Mystery Train. Oh, Mystery Train had a train out of 60 coaches long. And the other side was love my, oh, love my baby, love my baby. And Scotty took and reversed it and took the clicks off of that thing. Train I ride, 16 coaches long. Elvis sang it just like Elvis does, completely original his way. But Scotty had the way of finding, hey, there's a good lick but it belongs over here. No, I, it wasn't done intentionally. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was going to go get the record and listen to see. Just that, uh, obviously, what happened that 
the one from the one side just stuck in my mind when, when we started working on that song. And, uh, but it wasn't a deliberate thing. Many people play the straightforward Scotty Moore stuff, you know, like... But they forgot to do that reverse lick that is, you know. <laughs> but uh, a lot of that came from uh, using the high blues notes from people like the B.B. King's Muddy Waters, uh, Howlin' Wolf, and people like that in their music. And they added the bass strings with the Chet Atkins and Merle Travis and Bill Brunsey and people like that. But that's a great guitar style. It, uh, rock and roll would be the same without it, would it? The way I play, they... I think the people on the air thought it was two guitars. So, you know, I didn't draw a lot of mail. Everybody always asks about Chet, you know, because of, of the thumb and finger. Uh, but actually, I was forced into that, uh, trying to make more noise. Uh, carrying a rhythm and, uh, and some semblance of a uh, pattern or lead. I was telling other guys, I said, hey man, I said, Elvis would cut my song, man. And he didn't believe me. He said, oh man, get away from him. <laughs> and, uh, he didn't believe me. You know, so I said, well, you know, that's the way it goes. Well, it don't mean nothing, no way it goes. You know, that's the way it goes. Doing an odd looking skip. I parted the weeds and looked over the swamp, and I seen them cats doing the you bang your stomp. They treat uh, rockabilly as we treat Dixieland. They treat uh, rockabilly as we treat jazz. It's a separate form of music, it has loyal followers. We don't have that here. There is a market, a rockabilly market in England, that uh, will support uh, five or six tours a year for people such as Johnny Carroll, Mac Curtis, Sid King, myself, and, and some other people that come from Memphis. Uh, Eddie Bond goes over every once in a while. And it's, uh, it's a really a lot of fun. I wish that, uh, that we had a market like that here. It's really weird. In the rest of the world now, we're bigger than we ever were. And without a hit record, I mean, we've had 10,000 people in London, you know, we're in Paris and in Berlin and in Tokyo, and, you know. And um, we don't need to have a record out. There's a strong, loyal, super big following for it. Everybody call the police, it was getting them out of hand. You better listen, boys. You gotta understand it was a knockdown, drag out. Knockdown, drag out. When you got knocked down, drag out, you gotta find a place to hide. Ah! Well, I mean, we've been into rock and roll since we were about 15 the day, day, yeah. yeah. We're dancing our clubs and that, you know. This is our tenth time, the ninth or tenth time we've been up here. It's the ninth weekend, and we've been to my nineteenth weekend all in all. This is ninth them to be. Come to every year, have the roots done, get new clothes, the whole work. <laughs> like getting dressed up, you know, meeting blokes basically. <laughs> this is simply the best thing to go to, and uh, you don't have anything in Denmark coming to this one. Um, one day I might go to the States, and I'm into rock and roll for the States as well as a little bit of Denmark, but I first like, probably like the American States, something like that. <laughs> but I think rock and roll, 50s music, do well, rock and roll, whatever. It's a great thing to be here. Definitely the best ever. This rock, this weekender? Well, I think it's tremendous, you know. It's you know, it's like a fantasy world, isn't it? You, know, you check in, and you, you know, for three days, and all you hear is music, and... It's really incredible. I can't, I can't imagine anything like this happening in, in, in America, you know. I wish it would. Maybe someday it will. Well, I know you dig my blue suede shoes. I know you dig my real cool pants. I know you dig the way I pop. But when you mess with my duck tails, you better stop. Don't mess with my duck tails. Mess with my duck tails. If you mess with my duck tails, I'll get so mad at you. 
here's the old original guitar that you've probably seen on some of the album covers and what have you. And it, I mean, it really is the real one. It's just about had it. And there's the back of it. I even had to paste some leather over it because of the rhinestones and things that I wore. <laughs> well, I've got a guy. I like him fine, but he takes me for granted. All of the time. That made him mad. This is the uh, fifth annual Wanda Jackson Day Parade. The first one was in 1987. And this is the main street downtown Maud where Wanda Jackson was born. It's not a, a dying or a past tense. Rockabilly is a now and future. I try and make a point in our show to say, hey, this is Rockabilly. You like what we, you like it? You like it? Mm -hmm. People will leave, maybe Rockabilly fans. They came in not knowing what Rockabilly is. They may leave not knowing what Rockabilly is, but at least they're finding flat top fans. At least we're keeping that going. To be honest with you, I think it's a, a, a hit record away from being huge again. Because so many people love it, and so many people are passionate about it, that I think uh, it, it, it's close to being uh, popular again. I really feel that way. Watch out. Somebody is going to strike hard with rockabilly, and it's, it's going it's to be back again. I really, I really think it is. 